Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good morning. People, let's go. We've got a world to change, and this is the place to start. So I am a Canada Research Chair at the University of Saskatchewan, and this is my real life. My husband, my daughter, and my son. That's what motivates me to change the world. These are the things I enjoy. I do the long, long events. Why? Because if you're going to change the world, I need a lot of time to think. And 100 kilometers does that to you. As a Canada Research Chair at the University of Saskatchewan, I have been privileged in my career to travel the world, to meet amazing people in amazing countries, all because, for some reason, I was born with this passion for water. I didn't even like to swim, but for some reason, water has a real signature for me. I work at the United Nations. I get to muck around at some of our uh, largest industrial sites in northern Saskatchewan. I work with wonderful indigenous people with communities in the north. And of course, Africa is one of my favorite places. What I do, how much water do we have? Can I drink it? Can we swim in it? Can we eat the fish? Who is affecting it? How should we manage it? That's what I'm about. So what are we hearing? Make no mistake, people, water is the foundation for everything. Goods and services, a strong economy, natural resource extraction, health, wellness, recreation, food production, energy production, waste removal, and drinking water. In fact, your bodies are 75% water. 1.1 billion people lack access to safe drinking water. 2.6 billion people lack access to basic sanitation. 2.2 million people die each year. Those are mostly children from diseases associated with poor water quality and a lack of sanitation. In Canada, we're, no, uh, we're familiar with this as well. You've heard of Walkerton, North Battleford are our neighbors, Kasechewan, we've had fish kills. <laughs> What do we know? We know that there are more of us. We know the annual temperature is rising. We know the water supply is finite. What goes around comes around. There's only a few treatment steps in between. Humans have available less than 0.08% of all the Earth's water, yet over the next two decades, our use is estimated to increase by over 40%. We have all made a contribution. This isn't about pointing fingers, it's about taking responsibility globally, nationally, provincially. What do we need? I say we need a new umbrella. That's where women come in. Women have a special role with respect to water. I didn't know it. I had no idea. The United Nations states that if we are to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, one of those goals being providing access to safe drinking water and sanitation to people of the world, we must educate the women. Why? Because it's the women and their daughters in the developing world that manage the water, find the water, use the water in food production, walk for hours and kilometers to fetch the water and carry it on their heads. I have seen daughters the age of my own daughter carrying 20 liter jugs on their head on their way to school, crippled by the weight of the water on their heads. Women's roles are tied to water in the international community. In developing countries, women and girls spend an estimated 40 billion hours every year hauling water. 40 billion hours. I don't know how much that is, but it's a lot. Poor health resulting from inadequate water and sanitation robs children of schooling and adults of earning power, a situation aggregated, aggravated for women by the daily chore of collecting water. For pregnant women, access to water is important to protect them from serious diseases. Lack of adequate separate sanitary facilities in schools is one of the main factors preventing girls from attending school. Where women and men participate together in making decisions, 
That is where true success is realized. You cannot make decisions if women aren't part of the process because they manage the water in the international community. Decisions made about water allocation and use produce long-lasting effects on women's and men's lives. It makes sense, doesn't it? Women's involvement would improve governance, management, access, and sustenance. Evidence also shows that women are suited for the task. I began my own investigation because I couldn't understand why my language seemed to be so different from many of my colleagues. I couldn't understand why I could see a vision in a large picture, yet I was failed to be able to communicate that in certain audiences. So I started to look through the literature, and it's true, and these differences aren't a threat. These differences are what make us unique. These differences are what we should be celebrating and capitalizing on, not attacking each other for. Our brains are different, not in all cases, but our brains are different than many of our male counterparts. Women have greater connectivity, multiple things at one time. Multitasking is what we do. We think in a more integrated manner, we consider all sides of the story, sometimes to our own disadvantage, to reach consensus. These skills place women in a very unique, albeit challenging, role to address the water crisis. Women's skills, knowledge, and place in society place them in a crucial position for the effective and efficient management of water. One solution, then, for global water security is to link the developed world to the developing world through women. But Houston, we have a problem. Let's talk a little bit about women in science and engineering. I've been at this 20 years now, and I never thought I would be speaking about women in science and engineering. I love water. I just want to do my job. I want to save the planet with respect to water. I don't want young 11-year-old girls to be walking with 20 liter jugs on their head if they don't have to. Yet what I find is that women in science, there's barriers here in our own world, in our back door, that we need to be aware of and that we need to address. There are a lack of women progressing through the ranks, both within the academic community and in the science community at large. Despite an overwhelming number of female undergraduates, those women are not moving through to masters, PhDs, postdocs, and faculty positions. Women in faculty positions in science and engineering are greatest at the, the lower levels, the assistant letter, level. They're greatest at the assistant level and lowest at the full professor level. In Nature, just recently, the Journal of Nature in 2010, there's accumulating inequities in resourcing and respect with respect to women in science and engineering. Women scientists starting their careers in poorly equipped labs with fewer graduate students and less prestigious committees. If women are not in these roles, how is it going to happen? Canada Research Chairs. I'm a Canada Research Chair. What are Canada Research Chairs? Well, we are chairs that were kept in the country to avoid the brain drain. I'm a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair, and what that means is that I have the potential, I've been recognized by my peers internationally, that I have the potential to be a world leader 10 years out of my PhD. I was given that honor. 17% of all the chairs awarded are only given to women, have only been given to women, and all of those chairs, for the most part, have been tier twos. How are we going to change the world if women aren't placed in the leadership positions? The Canadian Excellence in Research Chairs, these are the super chairs. 19 of them have been awarded in Canada just recently. The University of Saskatchewan, that I am very proud to be a part of, was awarded one. I assisted in writing that proposal. Zero of 19 CERC chairs went to women. People, how are we going to change the world if we don't use the resources that we have? This isn't about one or the other. This is about using the assets we have to the best of our ability. There are tough decisions related to water ahead. 
The water issues are huge. It's bigger than any one individual, any one organization, any one political cycle. It takes a community. You jump in my boat for a while and I'll jump in yours. It's only together that we're going to change the world because it's too big <coughs> for any one individual, any one organization, or any one political party. The developed world has the potential to significantly contribute to the global water crisis through the interactions of women. Solutions must begin at home. So this is my boat analogy. I used to think if I built a big boat, we would all get into that boat together and sail away in the same direction. What was I thinking? And then I thought, well, maybe. There's so many leaders around us. We all have our own boats. We all have our own ideas and we want to change the world. So maybe if we each have our own boat, maybe the best we can do is we can all sail in the same direction. Because critical mass and tipping points of change require movement in the same direction. Right? Right. Or maybe we just all paint our boats the same color and we go in different directions. We all part of the same organization, but we're going to save the world in all different directions. Or maybe our boats are all different colors and we're all going in different directions. I want you to think about how we can change the world together. Do we need one boat? Do we need many boats? How many directions do we need to go in? If you jump in my boat for a while, I'll jump in yours. And together, I think we can make change. So I'm going to leave you with this. If you could tomorrow morning, that would be Sunday, make water clean in the world, you would have done in one fell swoop the best thing you could have done for improving human health and humanity and the economic situation of the globe by improving environmental quality. So people, let's go. Thank you. <laughs>